Hi there and welcome, it's Roger at Swift Cloud. And in this very quick video, I wanna go through a couple key considerations. These are absolutely critical for you to think about before you make an electronic signature decision. Now, there's a bunch of players out there that are uh, basically making these little tools where you can just draw on the screen and let's say they're WordPress plugins that you just plug in and it seems all very simple. There's so much more if you want actual legal defense. And presumably in most cases, that's the reason you want it. Now, if you just want somebody to sign and think that it's legally binding, but if it ever goes to court, you're gonna just have to probably let it go then maybe this doesn't matter. But for most people, presumably, if you're, if you're looking at electronic signature, you want something binding. So let's dive into it. And the cost of doing it right is really not that high. There's really no reason not to. So quick, just a really quick note about Swift Cloud. I'm not gonna dive into the whole product because it's incredibly powerful and we've built it out of necessity. So we started as an agency. We've worked with thousands of, of small businesses and just hundreds of sort of needs have bubbled up. And over the years, we've built this basically just out of necessity. Good ideas come to us from clients, perhaps somebody like yourself, and, and also a lot of WordPress developers and small business developers and consultants, that kind of uh, thing. People come to us with a problem and we just dive in and solve it. And we're in this wonderful space where we're small enough that you can actually get a human on the phone, possibly, probably me, and we're big enough that we're just growing way too fast. We're unkillable at this point. So things are really exciting and I, I want to help you and I want to help you make a decision because there is actually more at stake than what you think. So quick note about our electronic signature system. We've built two, we really have two different electronic signature systems. And of course, they're perfectly integrated. But one of them is short code driven. So as you can see on the screen, we have a short codes type of system. And what that allows for is a lot more power than these legacy 1.0 systems. So I know that there's these huge competitors that are billion dollar companies. Uh, and some of them deserve respect. But what they did is they tried to emulate paper. We didn't we took a different approach from day one. Now we also have PDFs. So if you need certain things like government documents, let's say it's a W9 or something and the output must be exact, then we do support that. But for most of our documents, it's let's say a, uh, a non-disclosure agreement or an employment contract or a waiver or something like that. It's a block of text and there's usually a signature at the bottom. That's the, sort of the most common and, and popular electronic signature. That should not be a replication of paper. So here's an example. So with this short code system, we can do things that paper never could. Do you have allergies? You check the box, a whole section opens up and says, tell us about it. Do you, have, do you carry an EpiPen? Do you need electronic, do you need a special, you know, who, what's your doctor's name, right? Uh, let's say, are you over 18? If you're under 18, okay, great. We need your parents' signature, right? And those other people, they never see that. Now those legacy 1.0 systems, they were never built for that because they were trying to replicate paper. They just never built that. We started in the digital world. And as a result, there's, there's dozens of things. We have got image upload. We've got video upload. We've got image embed. You can embed a passport photo or a driver's license photo right into the document. And when you sign, you're going to actually see it. Why does that matter? Let's say it's a karate school, a school for ninjas, right? And we've got a little system that says profile photo. So when that person becomes a user in your system, oh, and by the way, Swift Cloud is a complete social network. So whether you want it or not, it's just built into the platform. So if somebody signs, they actually become a user and that establishes a, a relationship between you and then everything is stored in a workroom. Why would you care? Let's say they sign 17 docs. You don't want 17 little folders. You want one folder with 17 docs in it. So all of that is stored. And where this gets a little bit more complicated, let's say you have a husband and a wife, well, they're kind of technically working as one entity, right? Or a husband and a husband, whatever, we've got no judgment about that. It's just a case of, of point being is that, that one point, let's say they're the home buyer, right? Together, they form one entity. So we've got this whole workroom concept. I don't wanna cover that. I just wanna help you solve your electronic signature need, which is what you came here for. So we've got two separate systems, one of which is short codes. It's super easy. What people usually do, what I do is people give us a document, let's say it's a Word doc or something like that. I will get it into a clean HTML. Usually I'll just throw it into Google Docs. We do have a converter and it varies on how clean it is. Sometimes it'll just spit it out and you're good to go. And then all the little underlying parts, you just rip them out and you put in a short code and you don't have to remember these short codes. You just use the short code generator, right? And that's so that you don't have to remember. 
that allows all these reserved fields like name and date and all of that kind of stuff. I don't want to talk about the product that much, but that's the basic idea. Now, for when the format must match exactly, typically this is government forms. Let's say in the mortgage world, uh, you have a, a form called a 1003, right? It must match exactly. Certain certain cases, you have to use a PDF. So we do support that. And you just what you basically do is you just drag in your sign here stickers, right? That kind of thing, your fields and your sign here stickers. Now, we also support... Uh, because it's a complete works, workflow system and a complete EDOC system, we have snippets, we have entire sections that can turn on and off. So let's say you're doing an apartment rental, right? And let's say somebody's coming in, do you rent or own? If they rent, then you open up a whole section about tell us your previous landlord, that kind of information. If you own, great, tell us a whole section about the um, previous, uh, about their mortgage holder, right? So that's just one example of many. So that's just one of the considerations and kind of a preview. Let's dive into it. So here's why a lot of the sort of Johnny come lately, these little tiny companies are like, oh, buy a plug-in for 20 bucks and you're good to go for life. Guess what? I could usually have those thrown out of court in minutes. And the reason is you cannot have the actual signature happen on a server that you control. And what I mean by you is a legally interested uh, party. So you need to have a legally disinterested third party. So in our case, we have to be able to go to bat. So we, we originally started as a WordPress plugin. Okay. And the actual signature happened on WordPress. And very quickly, we realized using CSS, using JavaScript, you could obfuscate and mess with the signer intent. And so anytime the actual signature is happening on a server in which one of the parties who are party to the signature, control it, that's basically, I, we'd have that probably thrown out because we could cast it into doubt. And a judge would look at it and be like, well, can you guarantee that it was? You'd have to use some uh, method of guarantee that the code had not changed. And that's that requires, you know, deep access to the server logs and that kind of thing. And even then that could even still be changed. You can override that sort of thing. So long and short of it, the actual electronic signature happens on our server. So in the case of WordPress, what happens is people use WordPress, send them to our site. They could be using some other CRM. Now we do support, uh, in terms of documents and, and data flow into our system, we do support post and get and APIs. And we've got a couple different ways you could even use another doc and chain a form to assign a signature. We've got a bunch of different options. We've been in this space for a while and we take this very seriously. So typically with WordPress users, they'll come in, they'll come, they'll, they'll come to uh, our server, but with your logo, we want your logo, your colors. Soon we'll have a top bar so it could even bring them back. We want to make that feel as seamless as possible. We can even do your domain, right? So what I mean by that is like a subdomain. So you could have, you could have a subdomain or you could have your actual domain, right? You could have have, um, you know, job at truckingjobs.com, right? And it go to an actual job application. You could also use a subdomain like secure.yoursite.com. It's got your logo, your colors. We just want people to feel like they're in the right place and for it to feel cohesive. And yet we have to be able to legally guarantee in court if needed, the contents of the signer of the signature, the contents of the document, and therefore guarantee the signer's intent. Right. We have to be able to do that as an expert witness. And that that's just the benchmark for success for what is expected here. Second, we, you must have once the document is signed, who's holding the actual signed PDF. So in our case, we generate an audit trail and we can guarantee the contents of the signature. And then once the document is signed, you also have a neutral, a legally disinterested, neutral third party that's holding it. And we could prove in court that neither party could change that. So when somebody signs something on our server, we have to be very careful about all these, all these various legal uh, consideration. So here's what I mean. So uh, COPA law. So in the United States, if a minor signs, so let's say you have a karate school and there's information about children, it's not even kids signing because that's not legally binding. They have to be over 18 to sign in the United States. But let's say you have information about kids, we have to follow COPA law. So where this gets incredibly complicated is when you get into things like medical. And sometimes these laws are even outright contradictory. So you might have uh, in the case of EU GDPR or in the Cal state of California, you have to anonymize data after a certain point. And yet with HIPAA, medical compliance, you have to store that data for seven years. This stuff gets complicated and you need somebody who takes it seriously. This is not going to be some little tiny thing or some free, some free plug and it's not going to get you where you want to go because there's so much more that most people simply don't know 
that they don't know, right? And we want to help you with that. So once the document is signed, you have to be able to legally guarantee that it is immutable, cannot be changed by either party, right? And so um, that's critical. And therefore, you are going to have to have a third party. Now, it is theoretically possible about blockchain, right? So we've looked into this and we kind of, te we technically use a private blockchain when maybe blo blockchain is accurate, but it's not a distributed ledger. So that's a lot of buzzwords. But what that's going to mean is, so let's say that that blockchain-based electronic, sig electronic signature came out. Guess what? You're still going to have to pay. It's not going to ultimately be any better. What it's going to do is it's going to add complexity and for very little payoff because now you have privacy concerns. Okay, so let's say this document's on the blockchain. What does that mean, right? Who can audit it? Well, if you can audit it, it means you can see the contents. And if you can see the contents, now you have a privacy violation. And furthermore, you're still going to have to pay somebody. There has to be some financial interest for to somebody to uh, to basically house that data. And so at the end of the day, blockchain even though it's, it can create a trustless environment and it's super useful and we're all excited about that kind of thing, it's not going to be the magic bullet to get you to like free electronic signature, right? So we, we look into this, we take this stuff very seriously, we're way into it, we want to earn your trust in business and I want to help you make a decision. So, all right, number three, the, the image that you see is just the tip of the iceberg and frankly, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors. What really matters is the digital signature behind the scenes. So we don't just measure, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can't see that even, the the, even our clients and subscribers can't see because again, we have to have uh, a lot of cards up our sleeves so that when we go to court, because we're going to go to court at some point, somebody's going to cast this into doubt. And when they do, we have to serve as an expert witness and say, oh, yes, we can prove that this person was there. And it's way more difficult to forge an electronic signature with a digital signature than it is with even an ink and paper, right? Ink and paper is not terribly secure. All you need is literally a pen and the moral disposition to do so. And maybe a reference of the original person's signature, but even who's checking that, like who's to know, right? So um, digital signatures, the electronic signature that you see is a portion, it's, it's sort of the tip of the iceberg on top of a d actual digital signature. So next you need to think about verifying the identity and intent. This is something that, um, Frequently at the very beginning, we didn't have that uh, added. And then we quickly realized the, the error of that. We have to be able to legally guarantee. So when you sign something, what you're really doing is you're claiming an identity and you're also agreeing to specific terms, right? So you have to verify identity and, and intent. Now, if you, there is something called constructive evidence. So if I have a longstanding relationship with you, you've been using the same email, and then you sign a doc and the IP address matches, the uh, email matches, the name matches, everything seems to match all of these other additional evidence, such as like shopping cart data and our relationship and our email history, then a judge is going to accept that in most jurisdictions, I'm referring to United States law and, and I've studied, I'm not a lawyer, so by all means, speak to your counsel about this. I'm giving you the um, layman's version of it, although I have studied contract law and we study, we take the stuff very seriously. So at that point, you have constructive evidence. What do you do, though, if somebody you have constructive evidence with with John at Doe.com and they come in and they sign at John Doe at Gmail.com? At that point, you don't have a guarantee that that identity matches. And therefore, we have to fire off a verification to that person and say, hey, you have to click this email. So I can't sign as Bill at Gates.com, right? I need to I, I don't have that email. Right now, if I did, then right, that, that would presumably match some sort of claimed identity uh, for the clients who are in Europe or especially concerned if you've got, let's say, high value or very sensitive documents. Uh, we do have additional uh, options. So, for example, in Italy, you must include a copy of your government ID. We do have the ability to embed a passport right into the document and include a picture of it. So you could do that with your driver's license. That's typically used with, let's say, job applications. It could be used for apartment rental, lease applications, that kind of thing. Things that are a little bit more serious where you, maybe you want that information anyway, right? So, um, and with that, we also increasingly, we now have the ability to sign and pay. So you can sign and pay right within one doc. You can actually embed the credit card form. So, and the actual button is smart enough to know that if there's a payment form included in the document, the actual button will change from uh, sign and send to sign and pay, sign and complete payment. 
And, and then of course, all this stuff is translatable. And, you know, if you needed help in a different language as well, but long and short of it, we've got uh, the options. Point being is the credit card matching is yet another form of uh, additional verification. In addition to all of that, because SwiftCloud is a social network, we have some, we can do some things that other people don't do and that we just need to verify that account once. And then you, uh, because it's a social network, you can have them log in and then access a session. So that's typically used for sales contracts where you create a complex form. So let's say it's a loan application and you have a complex form and you start filling things out over the phone. So in the old world, uh, I used to work in real estate years ago and doing real estate marketing and that kind of thing. And when we would start a, a loan application, we would start filling things out over the phone so that when it got to the client, it was mostly filled out. They just need to check a few things, maybe correct the spelling of the last name, sign it, and they were done. We can do exactly that with our sessions system. And so what you do is you make the e-sign doc as normal. And then what you do is you create a session for that person. Well, obviously that person has to be logged in because at that point, you know, you have sensitive information about that, right? So we create that. Nonetheless, that comes back to the uh, intent and the uh, identity of that other uh, person, right? So uh, next we have the signer. This is just a legal consideration that the, le that the signer must agree to terms. So some of these little plugins, if they don't explicitly say that they are warranting that the electronic signature is the same as a paper signature and basically cer certain other uh, compli you know, certain other considerations, if they don't explicitly agree to that, then it's worthless. You could have that thrown out of court because they didn't necessarily agree, right? Uh, where this gets complicated is again, we have potentially contradictory laws. So uh, again, let's say California's laws about anonymizing data over three years versus the HIPAA laws of requiring uh, things being requiring data being kept for seven years. Sometimes you have laws that are outright contradictory. And so there's a lot to follow up on. So next, uh, this is a legal consideration for some jurisdictions. I believe all of the United States is that the signer must have access to anything they sign. That's part of the United States law. And so by default, our system will email the signer a PDF copy and whether they like it or not, it is accessible. So everybody who signs any doc can be accessed at any time uh, within the consideration with mindful of the destruction date. Right. So let's say the destruction date is seven years, then up to that seven years, even if they close their account, we still have it uh, on the document. And of course, this is private. Ultimately, uh, very, we have to be extremely careful of privacy. So even if they close their account, we still have that account there. It's just uh, isolated and suppressed and locked, basically, but the document still exists. And that's a legal consideration. So again, this stuff gets, uh, there's more to it. Now, where this gets especially complicated is when you end up with multi-party signature. So let's say you have a real estate consider, like a real estate contract, or you have a husband and wife who have to sign. Well, if that husband and wife is together and using one device, great, no problem. They both sign in the browser, end of story, no big deal. Now, what happens if the one of the spouses is traveling, right? So you got, a, let's say, a, a husband and a husband or whatever, right? Um, in that case, the first husband has to sign, the second husband has to sign, and they're still filling the same role. Now, where this gets even further complicated is our, if you have multiple parties signing consecutively or concurrently. Now, if you just need a waiver, all this stuff is super easy. Let's just get you set up in minutes, and just all of these are kind of um, additional considerations. For the people that are in the waivers, there's so much that you, I guarantee that you're not thinking of. So in the case of waivers, for example, we've heard of cases of people redlining things. So what I mean by that is they'll go into, let's say, a karate school, and they'll just X out out some some paragraph that they don't agree with and initial it and if the owner doesn't catch it guess what if that goes into court you got a problem right another case is is 99.9 percent .9 of people are cool but we heard about a case in florida where somebody signed purposely using mickey mouse like fake data right and then later uh they acted a little fishy the person's kind of yellow flag was up but nothing no you know whatever they they were out doing water sports and that kind of thing and then a couple weeks later they had a court uh, case brought against them saying that they slipped and fell and they got it. They sustained an injury, even though nothing was ever reported on the day of. And then, of course, the person says, hey, you signed a waiver. And they're like, no, we didn't. Right. And so they had to look, go back and using paper, try and find the person that's that was there. Well, guess what? They didn't sign. They signed it with the intent of uh, scamming them. And so this system with electronic signature, you've got a little bit more uh, potential defense in the case of. Um, you know, considerations like that, like you can kind of work it into your workflow. And, um, you know, so you can, can uh, take, take more care, I guess, against those kinds of things to protect your business, right? And that's the whole goal here. So 
Another consideration is cost, right? So that's, I, I get it. If you're watching this video, you're probably shopping for electronic signature. Now, not using electronic signature costs more than the cost of the service. And now here's why. Integration, automation. It's not just your time, but it's also the integration. So let's say that you signed paper and pen. Let's say you use some plugin and then... 99.9% .9 of your life, everything's fine. And then you have one court case that costs $10,000. Well, guess what? That just blew your budget. Is that really worth it to you? Right? Let's say you have lost data. So in the case of electronic signature, let's say you're using old school paper and pen. Uh, is somebody going to actually type that in? Is that going into your marketing system? Is that going into your follow-up system? It should be tied to your reviews and your follow-up and your autoresponders and your marketing and, and that kind of thing. In addition, then you also have, you want a system for incidents. So let's say you have a karate school and somebody slips and falls. You want to get some documentation about that about that so you know if they so if they if let's say you offer medical services and then they decline that you want to make sure and have documentation about that here's what happened here's you know client decline this sign this little paper we have security companies using our systems right you know there's really lots of dis different considerations and all of this is just more than more than meets the eye so uh, and, and not to mention cold feet. So in the case of sales contracts, really by using electronic signature carefully and once you get it really set up and dialed in, you should be in sales getting a so contract signed before they get off the phone. There's no more of this chasing contracts waiting for something to come back. You just, you, they sign right there on the phone and be like, you hang up the phone and you're off to the races. That deal's done, right? And hopefully even paid. You just integrate the payment right into the document. So, uh, number eight is, is just something we kind of touched on this. Basically, don't try and replicate paper when there are better options existing. So we kind of, you know, we touched on that, but basically there, you, you got options. Organize and automate. That's really sort of like your if then logic, your responsive document. So another benefit of our short code system is it's, it'll work on your phone. So it'll, it'll still be readable. Now the PDFs, they won't work well on a phone and that's just, there's just no way around that because it has to match the exact format. And so we always try and steer people away from the PDFs if possible, because again, that's a legacy 1.0 replication of old school paper. And you used to see it on the paper, even with like the if then logic, like you see it on your taxes. Like if you filled out this box, then I'll go to line 17. It's like, we can just automate all of that. And it makes things so much smoother. It reduces the errors. It makes the clients feel like your system is a lot more professional. It feels just easy and breezy because because electronic signature, signatures in general, you just want to get people in and get them out and yet still have your business protected. And so by hiding stuff that is not relevant, let's say allergies, or let's say, you know, whether or not they're under 18 or over 18 or something in the case of a trampoline gym or something like that, then all of that can just make your life a lot easier and, and the experience a lot better for your clients. Last is choose carefully. So there are these little companies where like, hey, yeah, some developer in Ukraine developed it. And it was this great little plugin that I bought for 20 bucks is probably not even worth the 20 bucks. And in fact, it, it is probably creating more of a liability than you are thinking about. And so all of this, as you can see, is more complicated. You want somebody that's in it for the long haul, takes this stuff seriously. And we hope that's, we, you know, we believe that's us, right? We do um, take this very seriously and we, we follow the laws and um, try and stay up on things. And it's a rapidly evolving field. So on top of all of that, if, you, if you know, let's say something happened and an expert witness was needed, we have that available. We take it that seriously. And if you don't have somebody like that that's in your corner, what's the point, right? It's just at that point, it's cosmetics. Next is get started. So if you have any questions, by all means, dive into our system, take a trial, uh, take a try out the wizards, reach out to our support. You'll actually get a human. Um, and if you, if you call us, leave a voicemail, you know, we sometimes are bad about answering the phone and that's intentional because we want to be effective because in 97% of cases, any question you ask has already been answered. So what it will do is if you call us, leave a voicemail, we'll respond with that. And then we're happy to get on the phone. If you need more information, we're happy to get on the phone. We just want to be very efficient and leveraged, which is something I would hope that you would do with your business as well. We do have a help desk solution coming up uh, and it's really powerful. It's really designed for exactly that kind of thing. So electronic signature and SwiftCloud can absolutely help you grow your business. I'm committed to your success. So get started.